uh, thank you all for joining our evening session, uh, uh, Quantum Technologies in Industry. So I would like to uh, introduce our first speaker uh, today uh, for the uh, distinguished lecture. So Professor Zhang San Kim. Uh, Professor Kim, maybe you want to share your slides. Uh, sure. so, uh, Professor Kim received his uh, uh, BS degree from Seoul National University uh, in 1992. Uh, he got his PhD in physics from Stanford University in 1999, and he moved to uh, Bill Lab. Uh, in 2004, he uh, moved uh, to Duke and uh, is there uh, since then. So you can see from uh, Professor Kim's background, he's with this Duke Quantum Center, and he also leads this uh, multifunctional integrated system technology group at Duke. Uh, his main research area is quantum information science, um, his group uses trapped atomic ions uh, and uh, photonic technologies in an effort to construct a scalable quantum computer and uh, quantum communication networks. Uh, so today, uh, Professor Kim is going to tell us about advances in trapped ion quantum computing technology. So Professor Kim, the stage is now yours. Great. Well, thank you. First of all, I'd like to thank the organizers for uh, giving me this opportunity to discuss. Um, and um, also uh, wanted to thank all of you for, for attending. Um, I will tell you a lot about uh, my work, my ongoing collaboration with uh, Professor Chris Monroe's group. Um, he uh, was at University of Maryland, but he has recently moved to Duke. So we're going to be joining forces here. Um, and, and we'll tell you, I'm, I'm, rather than telling you a lot about physics, I'll tell you a lot about technology um, that uh, has been um, developing in, in, in my research group and starting to kind of propagate out, uh, hopefully into more commercial opportunities. Uh, so this is a work uh, done with uh, most of my uh, graduate students and postdocs listed here um, at Duke University. Um, and also many of these collaborations were, are with Chris's group, uh, first at University of Maryland um, and now at Duke University. Um, and we, we uh, like to thank all the sponsors for sponsoring our research to this point. All right, so there is very little um, introduction needed for what a quantum computer is, um, but um, to, to this audience, um, but I'd like to make sure that we, uh, we, think, we think about one aspect of quantum computers I'd like to point out. Um, so this is actually a quotation from, um, uh, from uh, one of the, my uh, distinguished colleagues, uh, Professor Bill Phillips, uh, a Nobel laureate at the labs. And he basically said a quantum computer differs more from a classical computer than a classical computer differs from an abacus. And here, um, the, the, what he wants, wanted to highlight is that um, the, um, the abacus and classical computers, uh, they both process information in a classical way. Um, and quantum computers uh, use a, a fundamentally different notion of, of qubits, quantum uh, information, and therefore the difference here is much bigger than here. And I think what he, he wanted to highlight is to make sure that we open our eyes and see um, that the way we need to build quantum computers uh, may or may not um, look anything like classical computers. Um, so uh, as we open up those opportunities, um, I think we have a better shot at achieving this, uh, um, this uh, very um, challenging yet uh, exciting uh, task of building quantum computers. Um, so all of you probably know uh, the, uh, the benefits of quantum computers. Um, and here, uh, we, I'm going to use the, this example of a Shor algorithm, which is the, the factoring problem, uh, to really highlight the power. Um, and this uh, work was, uh, this work here was presented by uh, Rod Van Meter and others uh, almost, uh, you know, 15 years ago, more than 15 years ago. And there, he, they analyzed uh, the time it takes to factor an n-bit integer on the, uh, on the y-axis uh, as a function of the problem size. And of course, this is in log-log scale. Um, and this NFS, this is kind of the number field sieve algorithm, which is the best known classical algorithm. Uh, and they estimated um, that there is actually a data point right here, which is a factoring of 512-bit number um, using computers um, technologies of 2003. And that's a long time ago. That's almost two decades ago. Um, but then uh, they estimated that in order to factor a 1,024-bit integer, um, you know, it will take uh, probably, um, you know, maybe tens of millions of years, if not billions of years using that technology. Um, what they also highlighted is uh, that uh, once we go to quantum algorithms, 
Um, and this is actually a quantum uh, computer running a Shure algorithm um, at a clock speed of one hertz, meaning they're doing one logic gate per second uh, using a, a somewhat specific uh, architecture. Um, you can actually do much better in the sense that you know this exponential scaling fundamentally changes uh, to polynomial scaling, and that's the power really of uh, of the Shure's algorithm. Uh, but in this case, still uh, factoring a thousand twenty four bit number will take thousands of years. Um, and you also see that when the si size of the problem is small, the quantum computers don't uh, give you any win at all. Okay, so when, when you're talking about small numbers, classical computers still work uh, quite a bit better. Um, what Rod and others have found out or pointed out back then is uh, that, uh, you, uh, and these three red lines show um, you know, the, the same algorithm that they're running. Um, the clock speed hasn't moved, but they actually moved to a more advanced uh, computer architecture. And that's kind of the point they wanted to make here. And this AC architecture means it's an abstract concurrent architecture. And what this means is, uh, you know, they, they imagine a computer, a quantum computer, where you can take two qubits out, out of uh, anywhere in the system and allow the, you to uh, apply a two qubit gate between them. If you, and, and it's very um, unclear exactly how you would build an architecture like that. Uh, but if you are allowed to do a fully connected architecture like that with a concurrency, meaning you can run gates in parallel, uh, then indeed the speed of solving these problems uh, can be reduced by somewhere between four to six orders of magnitude, okay? just by improving uh, the architecture as the problem size scales. And if you do that, the thousand bit uh, factoring uh, really now becomes a couple of day problem, uh, which means very practical. And of course, you can continue to improve the clock speed um, and in this case, you, you say, okay, I'm run, going to run exactly the same architecture as this bottom red line, um, but in this case, uh, running uh, a million times faster. Now I'm running a million quantum uh, logic gates per second. And if you do that, um, the, the 1000 bit problem um, can now be tackled in a couple of seconds. Okay, so, um, so, so really the, the highlight here is the quantum advantage takes an exponentially hard problem like this into a polynomial problem. Um, and then uh, there's a whole lot of technology uh, going from this top purple line to this uh, blue bottom line is uh, there, there's nothing new physics here. It's all about improving technology. And we've certainly seen that classical computers over the last six decades have really improved. Their performance has improved uh, by about 12 orders of magnitude uh, based on Moore's law. Now you can also say the Mo but Moore's law is exponential. It actually gets uh, twice as fast every couple of years. Uh, and indeed, if we can write Moore's law for another 30 years, um, this uh, vertical line, this uh, classical line does move down by six orders of magnitude. And now the billion year time scale will become a thousand year time scale, that's six orders of magnitude difference. But the scaling remains. And, and therefore, by going from 1024 bit encryption to um, 2048 bit, bit encryption, you're right back um, at, at billion years. So really the Moore's law is not gonna help you. Um, the quantum uh, computer can, it really changes the name of the game here. Um, and uh, you know, this whole, as I mentioned earlier, this whole line of uh, performance here is all about the realm of technology and engineering. Uh, so I, uh, what I'm trying to point out here is there's a lot of work we can do um, in terms of uh, innovation on the technology side to make quantum computers work um, to a useful level. All right, so with that, uh, let's think about what it takes to build a quantum computer. Um, and as we know, uh, we need qubits. And um, all of you us know that qubits have to support uh, what's known as the uh, superposition. Uh, it also has to support, uh, support um, entanglement. Um, and and both these two are basically the, the, the superpowers of quantum computers that make it different from classical computers. And we also know that we need to build logic gates, quantum logic gates. Um, just like classical computers are built out of this logic operations that uh, which gives a, a specific output given the inputs, uh, we also know that there has to be quantum logic gates. And, and just like classical, there are universal uh, theorem that says if you know how to build just a few uh, logic gates, but from this you can build an arbitrary uh, quantum circuit. Now, um, so, so uh, from a physicist point of view, when, when we're thinking about devices, uh, you know, these are the most exciting uh, and most important devices. But it turns out that when you go and talk to a circuit designer and ask them, okay, well, how do you build uh, processors out of uh, what you have? Um, they uh, look at different things. Um, so uh, it turns out that if you look at a real uh, chip, in this case, 
It's a chip with a single layer of uh, uh, transistors on the surface of silicon. Uh, usually a, a real CMOS chip actually contains almost a dozen layers of wires. Um, and if you look at the, the actual designers spending time, they actually spend pretty, pretty much all of their time drawing wires because how you connect up these devices really gives you what kind of computational power um, your, your chip will have, okay? Um, so in classical computers, um, and, and this wires actually shows you how to move information from uh, within a, a computer processor. Um, and that um, uh, flow of information is, is just important, if not more important than the actual processing unit itself. Um, so the classically, the wires are um, a relatively straightforward devices. I'm not saying they're easy to make, but they're relatively straightforward devices. Uh, but quantum wires where you can transport quantum information reliably within a processor is going to be um, a, a pretty challenging task. Um, and really the complexity of the quantum wires you can build within a processor, just like classical, will tell you what kind of uh, um, uh, computational tasks you can run effectively in your system. So I'd like to point out that those are very important elements as you think about building and designing systems. All right, so I'd like to uh, then now dive in and, and talk about trapped ions and why we uh, think uh, trapped ions is, is a very uh, promising platform to, to work on quantum computers. So um, in uh, most of our research, we use uh, this Ethereum uh, 171 uh, isotope. Um, and the, the advantage of this ethereum is uh, the ground state of this atom looks very much like the hydrogen atom, uh, which means that there is one outer electron um, and the, at the ground state, the, the electrons don't move or, or their um, quantum numbers corresponding to their uh, angular momentum and uh, excitation are all zero. Uh, so the only degree of freedom you have is the internal degree of freedom for, for electron spin. Okay, so there are two levels um, corresponding to the spin up and spin down of the electron. Um, and this also, this atom also has a, a nuclear spin of one half, uh, just like the hydrogen atom. And the nuclear spin, and therefore also has a spin one half. So it has a spin state up and state down. So in the ground state, um, you finally, you basically have this spin half nucleus and spin half electrons interacting with, with each other. And it creates this thrill of this four level system with a single state and a triple state. By, and this is called the hyperfine coupling. And if you pick these two states with the, uh, the, uh, the um, MF, uh, the, the um, Z component of the, of the spin to be zero, um, those two levels actually have a very stable energy difference. And in this case, it's about 12.6 uh, gigahertz. Um, and this is actually a, a really uh, important baseline of quantum state. Um, it actually has some, some fundamental advantage from the physical point of view. Uh, so all of us know that if you take these two as qubits, uh, the qubit states are now described by uh, two numbers. One is theta, which tells you the amplitude uh, distribution between the zero and the one state, um, and phi, which is the uh, phase difference between these two states. Uh, and of course, in this phi, what we uh, initially typically ignore is that if two, these, these two uh, levels have energy, lo energy difference of, uh, of E, uh, then there is an, uh, 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 a precession of the two lo energy levels by omega, which is e, given, e divided by h bar, okay? So if we know this frequency exactly well, um, then you know exactly what the phase relationship between these two are. But if this frequency actually fluctuates, um, then over time, you're gonna pick up some random phase. And that is precisely the uh, mechanism uh, by which you lose coherence uh, between the two systems. All right, so this is kind of the baseline. Um, it turns out that if you look at T1, T1 is basically the, the time scale over which this data gets messed up. Okay, this is kind of spontaneous decay between the two levels. Um, and of course, T1 and T2 are the NMR language to, um, to describe the coherence of this, this two level quantum system. It turns out that uh, for if you calculate the spontaneous emission of uh, an energy decay between these two levels, um, it's really, really long. Okay, it's, it's so long that it's impractical to measure. For example, in hydrogen atom, it's estimated to be about uh, 3 million years. Okay? Uh, so it turns out that there is basically no spontaneous emission between these two levels. Um, we believe that in, in ethereum, it's probably measured in, in thousands of years. Um, so uh, practically, it, it does not uh, spontaneously uh, decay, these two levels. Um, what, what actually does mess up these two levels is uh, if the atom or the ion collides with the background uh, molecule, 
uh, and that collision can actually mess up the internal state. So you're actually purely limited uh, by collision, which means you, your, your T1 time is limited by vacuum and not by any fundamental physics. Now, if you think about T2, practically, right, we can get uh, T2 about one second with, without trying much, meaning if you trap this ion, you basically get T2 of about a second. And if you make some efforts, you can actually make T2 hours and hours long. And people have they have demonstrated um, um, basically several hours of T2 in the same qubit. Uh, so what this also means that the, the T2, which is the dephasing, is also doesn't seem to be limited by some fundamental physics. It turns out that the hyperfine coupling here is some of the most uh, stable frequency references we can find. Okay, so if you, for example, go to cesium, which also has a similar hyperfine structure, uh, the cesium hyperfine level is actually 9.192631770 uh, gigahertz. And it turns out that this number, this frequency of the hyperfine splitting for cesium is exact, exact in the sense that we use this as the absolute reference for defining what one second means, okay? Um, so if you're trying to fi measure frequency, uh, this is your absolute reference. By definition, this is exact. And everything else um, is an error uh, trying to match or count uh, your energy from this level. Uh, so what this means, and, and, then, and it turns out that the physics is the same. So you might as well uh, pick the terbium to give you the exact uh, uh, reference for frequency, uh, which also points out that this is actually the, the most stable frequency reference you can find. And therefore, um, the T2 can be made um, uh, as long as you want um, if you have the technology to lock your classical oscillator exactly to this level and isolate the qubits uh, from the environment, okay? Um, so um, basically, um, if you're looking for a perfect qubit which can store information without degrading in nature, um, you need to look no further. Um, this uh, hyperfine ground state of, uh, of an atom is exactly what you need, okay? Um, which means that if you can perfectly isolate this with your technology, um, then you store a qubit and it will stay there for as long as you want. All right, so that's a strong statement, but I think uh, there is some, some real physics behind um, um, the, the standards um, that, that shows you that this is um, not, not necessarily a, a hyperbolic argument. Um, now, of course, that does not mean uh, that you can do perfect quantum computation. Okay, this is a, maybe, it may be a perfect storage device for qubits, but it's not necessarily a perfect uh, processing device for qubits, uh, but it's a pretty darn good one, okay? So let's think about what it takes to um, kind of process the information here. So you, for, you know, first you have to kind of initialize the quantum state um, if we want to do quantum computation. And here what we use um, is now we start to use other levels, other excited levels. And when you do that, then imperfections start to creep in. Uh, but the atoms are such a clean system that you, you typically can compute exactly what these imperfections are um, and you can actually hit that limit, okay? Uh, so uh, for example, when you start to initialize, uh, you use what's called an optical pumping, which means that you shine laser beam with a precise uh, wavelength uh, so that the atoms from uh, these three levels are pumped up and then they can decay back down into any one of these four, but once it decays down into this one at the bottom, you don't pump it out again. And therefore, um, you, you collect all of your population here. And it's very easy to get uh, more than four nines of initialization here. Uh, it turns out that the fundamental limit um, given by not off-resonance scattering um, in, in a quantum system is about six nines of fidelity in initialization in this atom that you can do. Now, the second thing you need to do is you have to kind of be able to detect which qubit state this is in. And for that, what we, we use what's called a state-dependent fluorescence. Um, what this means is when the atom is in one state, um, you shine a laser beam uh, that's resonant between this line and that line, and the atom will get excited, and this level will actually now decay. It decays into one of these three states with equal probability and scatters a photon. It emits a photon. And then once you're down here, um, this, this laser can excite it again, and it will keep doing that, meaning it, it keeps scattering photons, which means the atom will glow, okay? And if you collect some of, amount of this light um, and, and, and look at the histogram of the photon collection, you can see that there is a, a finite, uh, um, um, some bright uh, atoms that you can, you can detect. Whereas if you start from this state, uh, it's off resonant and therefore there is no photon scattering. And now the uh, photon distribution uh, looks like this. And you can actually very clearly distinguish this black distribution from this uh, red distribution. 
with more than three nines of fidelity in this atom. Now, there are some imperfections, which means that sometimes um, due to the quantum mechanical nature, you can, you can accidentally scatter. If you're, even if your laser is far detuned, you can off resonantly scatter into this and the dark ion can, uh, can, dark, can turn bright. And likewise, the bright ion can turn dark. So that there's a little bit of confusion. When you're doing the measurement, the atomic state can flip with very small probability. And that's what limits your, gay, uh, your detection fidelity uh, to about three nines in this scheme. But there are other schemes that can push this into four and five nines and people have demonstrated those things. All right, so that, that's pretty clean. Um, and then uh, now if the next thing is to trying to do um, gate operations and gate operations means you now have to manipulate these states um, in a single cubic gate, you can actually shine microwave on, onto this resonance at 12.6 gigahertz and you can actually uh, flip the states uh, at will. And it turns out that microarrays are pretty clean um, and you can do single cubic gates with errors in the 10 to minus four to 10 to minus six range without too much problem. And I can tell you how close to perfect we can get on this. Uh, we um, used what uh, a process called gate set tomography. Uh, and this actually tells you uh, if you're trying to do um, a single cubic gates, it actually allows you to run uh, concatenated gates of uh, a very large numbers of sequence. Um, and then it tells you, um, you know, at the end of the day, what the quality of each, each gate is. Um, and these are some complex numbers, but here now we're doing basically um, GI is like a, a, an identity gate. You can see that um, the uh, in, infidelity and uh, trace distance and diamond norm, these are like three different measures. Uh, you can see that these are five times 10 to minus, 10 to minus four, which is the error here. Um, and it can, and uh, GX is uh, kind of doing a, uh, uh, Pauli X gate uh, over two, and GY is doing Pauli Y gate over two. You can see that all of these uh, gate fidelities um, and even the most strict measures like trace distance and diamond norm are about five times 10 to minus four, and they're the same. Now, the fact that infidelity and diamond norm are the same means that all of the coherent errors, which means your systematic errors in the system, in this, in this operation, has been completely taken out, okay? Um, and you can see, that if you look at the rotational um, angle and then the rotational axis, they're very, very close to, to one half of pi. Now, it turns out that for this gate that we were testing, um, our gates are about 500 microseconds long and the cu cubic coherence was one second. So if you look at purely what is the gate fidelity, infidelity you expect um, by looking at the, the coherence time and the gate time, that's exactly 5, 10, 10 to minus four. And that's where we are. So in, in a microwave gate, uh, because the interaction can be, can be controlled extremely well, uh, we get to kind of the fundamental limit where your gate fidelity is uh, truly limited by the coherence time. And uh, in a similar experiment at Sandia, for example, um, they actually had a much longer coherence time and they had a faster microwave gates. Um, so their um, er errors were much lower, just, just purely given by that ratio. Now, it turns out that, uh, that although the, the, the microwave gates are very high fidelity, uh, it's very hard to individually address ions if you have many ions in a system. Uh, so what we do here is we, um, again, use uh, uh, laser beams um, to, off, uh, to, to off resonantly uh, drive this transition. And this is called the Raman transition, where you use two wavelengths, uh, two, uh, two photons with a frequency difference that matches exactly um, the, the cubic frequency. And of course, when you use lasers, now you actually have other mechanisms. You have spontaneous uh, emission, although this laser is very far detuned from this, uh, the, the, the real levels, there can be spontaneous decay, which actually um, decoheres the qubit state. Um, and also the lasers tend to have more, um, it, it will give you more addressability, but it also comes with more baggage, like uh, uh, for example, the uh, laser intensity noise and, and, and pointing noise and things like that. Um, so, but so, so we were able, to, but we were still able to get to the errors in 10 to minus four range. And, and these are actually not very hard to do. Uh, not only some of the research uh, um, groups here, but also, you know, many of the, uh, the companies who are building uh, ion trap quantum computers can easily reach this kind of error, error limits uh, for single cubic gates. Um, now, the, the next thing is uh, doing entangling gates. And entangling gates is probably the trickiest one. Um, in in most, uh, most quantum computers, entangling gates are hard, okay? So here uh, we, uh, we actually trap a long chain of ions. This is a, a, an example um, shown from, from Chris's team, but you know, you know, this is an, a, a chain of ions uh, that, that they trapped. 
And what they what we do is we um, allow um, a focused laser beams to hit um, any one of these ions um, in an individually addressable way. And there are many ways to do it. You can actually set up a multi-channel acoustic optic modulators that actually uh, points the beam to this. Uh, in our group, what we do is we take a single beam and we use uh, small micro mirrors and we can, we can steer the beam uh, to target whichever ions that we want. Uh, but at the end of the day, you, you have individual addressability uh, with this Raman beams. And then what we do is we apply what's called a state dependent force. Okay, what this means is if you tailor your laser beam correctly, um, then you can actually uh, push the ion up if the atom was in one state, but push the ion down if the ion was in down state, which means that if you had an internal state that was a superposition state, after applying this force, uh, the portion of the wave function that corresponds to a spin out will go up, and portion of the wave function that corresponds to spin down will go down. Okay, which means that you will now take the atom and split its wave function in space. And, and that is a, a, a very um, well-defined interaction you can have um, it, with this laser pulses. Um, and then what happens is you think about the, uh, the energy difference. Now there's a Coulomb coupling um, uh, given between these two uh, atoms, uh, ions, uh, with a separation of R, uh, which is given by E squared over the distance. Okay, uh, that's the energy. Uh, but when uh, you have two atoms that have the same uh, spin direction, for example, if both were uh, stayed up, then both of them move together. If they were both down, both of them move down together. And therefore, the separation, um, the distance separation doesn't change in that case. But if one of them was down and the other one was up like this, um, then after applying this force, um, the atoms go like that, which means that now their average separation is going to be increased by a little bit. And it, that delta is the amount that the atom is pushed up or down in this energy, uh, in, in this chain. Um, and what this means that you actually induce an energy difference between the final state and the in initial state. Um, and that uh, approximately looks like a dipole-dipole interaction where the size of that dipole is given by the charge of the atom um, multiplied by the separation or, or the displacement of the atom locally. Um, and this turns out to be a pretty big dipole moment. Um, and if you um, co collect this amount of energy and then let this atom sit there for some time and bring it back, um, then now you accumulate a phase. Okay, what this means is that you can induce an interaction where if the two atoms are in the opposite, uh, in the different state, um, then you induce a, a, a phase shift. And this amount of phase shift that you collect uh, turns out to be sufficient to, to create an entanglement. Okay. Um, so this is kind of a very native, very, very natural way to do um, uh, two cubic gate um, in ion traps. And it's called an Ising gate or XX gate um, or molmol Sorensen gate is another way to say it. Um, and it typically takes about uh, uh, 10 to 100 microseconds, maybe typically 100, 100 or uh, a couple hundred microseconds. Um, and then the fidelity of this operation um, is actually improving. I mean, we, we started from, the community started from maybe 99, 98%. Um, but there are, um, there are demonstrations of these types of gates where the gate fidelity is 99.9% .9 or even better in some recent, recent results. Okay, and of course, in order to get there, you just have to make sure that the system, um, all of the uncertainties and drifts and, and, and noise sources um, from the system is taken out. Um, again, I, don't, I think uh, there are some fundamental limits uh, associated with this uh, uh, lead, uh, due to the spontaneous emission, uh, but that, those limits are probably in the 10 to minus 5 range. And until you get there, it's all about systematics and making your system um, work better. All right, so um, you know this this is kind of how you you uh, you build quantum computers out of ion traps. Um, now, a typical ion trapping experiment looks like this, and this is a, a picture from Chris Monroe's lab about five years ago. Um, and uh, an ion trap experimental lab looks like this. You typically have an optical table, um, typically more than one. In this case, they have three optical tables. And then there's a, a forest of lasers and optics that are on the, on the table, uh, sometimes a second floor um, because the surface is not enough, a bunch of uh, electronics that's controlling them. Um, and that's what it takes to run an ion trap experiment. And, and although this is very impressive uh, uh, work, it really does not look like a quantum computer. Or maybe it looks like a, a classical computer from 1940s when people built uh, computers out of uh, vacuum tubes. All right, so we, we felt, and then of course, this takes a lot of people to run it. The lasers need to be stabilized. You need to tweak the alignment every day. 
uh, which actually is um, is a very uh, painful thing to do. Um, so um, about five years ago, we we um, got a bunch of funding from IARPA, um, and the goal was to build a uh, demonstrate error correction. Um, but we also realized that in order to do a sophisticated algorithm like that, we really have to build better systems. So we actually took the experiment um, that the picture that you saw here, and then we actually uh, divided the, the system into components. There is a vacuum chamber, there's a laser that's needed to drive the gate, there is a way to deliver the lasers. We need a bunch of what we call the CW lasers that are needed to, to do the housekeeping operations for iron trash. We need the trap and we need controllers. Uh, so we actually now uh, took the experiment and, and, and compartmentalized them into subsystems. And then we started to build a system that looked like this. Okay, so now, it, although it's still not, not a very small thing, it now fits into, um, into a box, a reasonably large box. Um, and then uh, we, and, and this system actually is now up and running in, in Chris's lab. They actually demonstrated the first um, error correcting code um, with this system, so on, which is all great. Um, and uh, the, the real interesting thing uh, in this kind of an architecture is if you go back to the ion chains like this, uh, it really does not, that once you have a chain, um, you can, and if you have individual addressability, you can induce this gate among any pair of ions in the system. Uh, although the ions in a linear chain, the actual gate that you can apply is completely, um, completely uniform, meaning you can do arbitrary pairs of gates. And what that gives you is an all, what we call an all-to-all -all connectivity. And there was some study uh, done by uh, Professor Margaret Martinez's group, and this was at, at Princeton University, even with some collaboration. Now they compared a running a whole, whole bunch of different algorithms uh, on various quantum computers. Uh, they took uh, two systems from IBM and Rigetti based on superconductors. Uh, and they also collaborated with uh, the University of Maryland group, in this case, Nova Linkis group, uh, where they had an operational five qubit machine. Um, and these are uh, the performance of uh, multi different algorithms. And BV is the, what, the, the, what's called the bernstein bazarani algorithm. HS corresponds to what's called the hidden shift algorithm. And these are Toffoli gates, Fredkin gates, and, and so on and so forth. Quantum Fourier transforms, some simple adder circuits. So they do, did a bunch of uh, computational tasks on them uh, and then measured the success rate uh, of running those algorithms. Now, first thing you note know is uh, you know, there are um, six, eight, um, six and eight bit algorithms where um, they, IBM and Rigetti had enough qubits to run them, but uh, the five qubit system at Maryland did not. Okay, so you can see that there are no um, ion data here. So let's ignore them for now. Um, um, and then you look at this um, hidden shift two and, and quantum Fourier transform. It turns out that these algorithms tend to be relatively local, meaning that all the uh, gates that are needed um, are kind of ne nearest neighbor kind of, kind of thing. HS2 only need, has, has two qubits and therefore you only need one, uh, one entangling gate to, to run them. Um, so in this case, you see that all of these uh, succeed with a pretty good probability, um, although the ion traps are a little bit better because the fidelity of the gates were, were better in this case. Um, but if you look at the rest, um, you can see that uh, now these start to require gates that are not uh, adjacent to each other. And depending on the architecture, if, you're, if you have to run two qubit gates between say qubit one and qubit four, and if they're not directly connected, then that single gate has to be translated to multiple entangling gate operations. Um, and because the gate operations are not uh, perfect, um, if you translate one gate into multiple gates, then the, the success probability or the fidelity of that operation starts to go down. Um, so you can see that in many of these cases, um, you know, the success probabilities uh, will actually start to go down substantially um, because of the connectivity that's provided in the architecture. You can see that for iron traps, um, they all remain pretty high uh, because uh, every qubit is connected to every qubit. Okay, so this actually shows now, there are other comparisons. This is a paper by uh, Nova Linke and others. Um, for ion traps, a, a five qubit uh, ion trap case, every uh, qubit is connected to everything else. Uh, but in some superconducting cases, that's not the case. And for example, in this case, if you have to do a gate between five and one or five and three, then you actually have to translate that single gate into two gates. Um, and th that's what actually starts to degrade the performance of the system. So this all points out that connectivity uh, in, a, in a system architecture is, is super critical. Um, so um, we are now, of course, thinking about how to take this very simple model um, and create uh, larger and larger systems. 
Um, and one way to do that is uh, you think about a, a, a set of beams that are coming in into a region, and we can actually now uh, move the ions back and forth, just like a, a tape and a, and a, and a head in a, in a hard disk drive-like uh, architecture, um, and, and try to scale. Uh, but what's more um, promising and interesting is uh, building a pretty sophisticated uh, uh, computer uh, ion trap chip like this, and then moving these uh, uh, chains, ion chains around um, in so-called a quantum CCD architecture. Um, and of course, these ideas have been, um, have been around for, for almost two decades. And of course, the, the technology development for the last uh, 15 years or so is really enabling this kind of a uh, uh, system to become, to become real, uh, practically realizable. And people have made a lot of progress uh, on this front. Now, one last element that we'd like to introduce um, is photonic interconnects. And this is where um, you have an ions, and the ion, um, you have a, a small ions for a quantum computer, uh, but the, one of the ions there is connected to a fiber, uh, and it, it emits a photon. But it emits a photon in a way that the degree of freedom of the photon is entangled with the atom that emitted that. And if you do that, um, then you can actually direct these two photons to an output uh, through an optical switch, uh, so that these two photons interfere, uh, you can do this in a way that if you do a proper bell state measurement between these two photons, you can create an entanglement between the two atoms that emitted them. And this actually allows you uh, to create a fully connected uh, architecture for multiple ion trap quantum computers to, to be connected. Um, and I think this is, um, this is kind of the, the, the long-term vision that we're working towards. Okay, so in the last 10 minutes I have, I'm gonna tell, give you some idea of advanced technologies that we're, we're doing for ion trap quantum computers. Uh, so first, and, and now here um, is it, starting to get a little bit uh, less physics-y and more, more technology. And, and uh, in some sense, it's a little boring from a physics point of view, but it gets very exciting from a engineering and technology point of view. Uh, so I told you a typical laser setup uh, looks like this, right? We have a bunch of lasers and mirrors and lenses um, modulators, and they're all mounted on individual mirror mounts, and then we assemble things like this. Um, and although you can make uh, an arbitrary flexible setup like this, um, when they are set up in an optical table like this, and if you require like ultimate stability, you have an issue. You, we, we basically have to come in and tweak these kinds of systems every day before we can run. Uh, but my colleague Dana Anderson at, uh, at, at Jilla uh, once says, if you know exactly what you want, you can make it really well. <laughs> Um, and it turns out that once you set up a laser system like this in our, se in our setup, we never touch it. We never reconfigure them or change them. So we know exactly what functions that needs to be served. Uh, so what that allows us to do is now take a uh, optical setup like this, um, and then we can actually uh, do a much better uh, mechanical and optomechanical design, an optical and optomechanical design, um, so that we actually build a optical setup like this. Uh, and we, when we do that, uh, it turns out that uh, it's super stable uh, in the sense that we've actually never touched this optical setup uh, for about two years. Uh, whereas for a setup like this, we had to come in and tweak it every day. Okay? Um, so um, you know, a laser system and setup being unstable um, is, is a challenge, but it's not a, a fundamental challenge. It's basically, a lot of the problems arises from the, fact, from the way we do things. And if you do things in a different way, then you can actually make them a lot better. In fact, uh, typically, we have a full laser table um, uh, that, that houses all the stable lasers that are needed to, to do an ion trap. Uh, but with this um, uh, progress, we've actually now taken all of that uh, um, thing on, a, on an entire optical table and put it onto an instrument rack. Okay? So you can see that we have some commercial lasers that, that, that now arrive in 19-inch racks. Um, we put a lot of these modulation uh, functions into optical fibers. Um, and then we have uh, a couple of shelves, shelves where we actually do this kind of a customized free space optic. Um, and then, uh, in fact, you know, this is so stable that we don't even need an optical table, and we actually just just put it aside and never never look at it. It becomes like, a, a, you know, for example, the in the fifties, people make microwave equipment, which was very complicated uh, and typically was, was set up on a table, and they uh, like Hewlett Packard started to put them into boxes uh, that pe pe people can use. I think our lasers are actually getting to a point where we can put them into boxes and, and put them aside and, 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 and they're reliable enough to run. Okay? So, so that's kind of one set of technologies we've done. Now, the second set of technologies uh, we've, we've, we've thought about um, is how painful these UHV vacuum chambers are. So you know, in, in, in order to really create pristine environment, we have to get the vacuum levels down 
so part in 10 to the 11 or, or better. Um, and that requires a pretty uh, painful way of designing and assembling chambers and baking them for weeks, uh, several weeks. Um, and, then, and then they become pretty bulky. So we did, we did want to change the way we do things here. And what we have done is uh, you know, decided that we only wanted to leave what's needed in a vacuum chamber in vacuum um, and try to shrink the vacuum chamber. And, and uh, now a vacuum chamber is this uh, ceramic package uh, forms a vacuum chamber. And we have the little, little tiny lid uh, that we put on and inside we have a couple of cubic centimeters worth of vacuum uh, compared to several liters of vacuum here on the left. Now in order to make this work, um, uh, we collaborated with Colquanta and created this vacuum facility. And what this vacuum facility does um, is actually you, you put in the package and the, and the lid and inside the vacuum, they actually seal this um, and, then it, and then it comes out. Okay? And at the end of the day, what you get is a, a little package like this that is already vacuum compatible uh, that you can ship. Uh, so they actually make these packages and ship it to us and then we put it into our experiment and run. So we've actually created this vacuum, turned this vacuum problem into something like a packaging problem with a, with a customized facility to support it. Um, actually, once your uh, ion trap is in a vacuum package like this, it's very hard to use thermal ovens. Typically we heat up metal and then evaporate the metal and then we trap them, but that becomes very hard to do. So we actually now start to do laser ablation, which means um, we actually have a bunch of lasers that are needed to load and then we have a piece of metal uh, inside our oven. And then we just send a very strong pulse uh, of a nanosecond laser um, to hit the metal surface. And it turns out that it deplates a little bit of atoms and then it actually traps. And we got it down to an extremely efficient way of doing it. Uh, so this is actually, if you start from an empty trap, and if you send a single ablation pulse, uh, you load one ion with about 50% probability. Um, and you load at least, and sometimes you get two, three, even five ions for one pulse. Um, and you, you load at least one, pulse, one ion with more than 85% of probability. What this means is you press a button and an ion shows up, okay? Um, and then uh, we actually now uh, created a, a cryost cryogenic experiment uh, where we, we start from a commercial cryostat um, and then we, we loaded a vacuum um, chamber, that little package, uh, um, which is loaded on this gold cool finger. We have some in imaging optics um, and we, we actually put them all in here. And then now we try to load this system. Um, and this is our cryostat, a commercial cryostat. All of our optics is around, uh, arranged in this uh, rather compact form. Uh, and we can actually successfully load ions. Um, and the ions uh, in this cryogenic, because the vacuum is so good, the ions and ion chains remain in trap for days, uh, if not weeks. Uh, the only time we lose our ions is when our lasers become, go unstable, okay? Um, and we, we also showed that the heating rate of this uh, transverse motion that's needed to drive the gates is really low. We're, we're at uh, maybe 10 to 20 quanta per second range um, at this base temperatures above about six Kelvin or so. Uh, so this actually is about two orders of magnitude lower, uh, actually more than an order of magnitude lower than what we observe at room temperature. Um, and we, we are, we're very hopeful that we can do very high fidelity um, gate operations on these things. Uh, so our current ion trap system looks like this. Right? We have a cryostat and a bunch of uh, optics where the lasers del are, are delivered by fiber. Uh, we have a Raman laser uh, with some optics. Again, the Raman beams are also delivered through fiber. We have an ablation laser here. Um, and these are CW lasers, uh, which more recently they, they've take, taken off the table. Um, and then we can actually box them up and, and, and go. Um, and on the last element I'd like to show is, uh, you know, we, we, we initially created these packages and, and went to cryogenics to do better vacuum. Uh, but we also realized that if we um, had a local pump, we can actually do a pretty good vacuum at room temperature. Okay, so this is kind of the miniaturized uh, uh, vacuum chamber that we worked with uh, Cole Quanta to make. So on in here is the little tiny vacuum uh, chamber that I showed you before, uh, but uh, Cole Quanta has put together a, uh, a proprietary and custom uh, ion pump back here, which is about an inch in diameter and maybe five centimeters long. Um, and with this, we can now uh, load an ion uh, in here. And now you can see that the vacuum chamber is, is, is tiny and all of these optics around here is more complex. Um, and we were able to load chains of ions. It turns out that the vacuum in here was surprisingly good. So what, we are, what we're doing 
is now we try to um, kind of uh, you know organize the optics around this to try to make it a little bit more compact system. Um, and here is our latest uh, setup uh, where uh, we have an ion vacuum chamber in the middle. Um, and then we have some optics that are surrounding it um, that's needed to trap um, and, and do some basic aid operations uh, in, the, in, the, in the system. And it all fits on a, um, on a plate that is about 30 centimeters on a side, okay? Um, and this actually shows the full uh, system. It's actually on two stories. The, the top layer has all the, all the trap and the, and the lasers associated with it. And the bottom is uh, our imaging system. And we've successfully loaded ions in this chamber. Um, it's very stable. Um, and now we can do all of these uh, optics uh, and, and everything else um, in about a volume of uh, 30 centimeters on a side. So, um, you know, this is again, it's still very preliminary, uh, but it just tells you um, that uh, the notion of starting from a ion trap experiment like this, there's a long ways that we can go to try to take this ion trap technology and turn them into something potentially much more practical. Uh, so the first step we took is this system that we built. Um, and, and, you know, we started designing and building this in 2016. By 2018, we had one of these up and running. It turns out that Chris has been running this system throughout the pandemic from home, right? It's a, nobody's allowed in the lab. Um, this uh, system sits in the lab and they were able to remotely operate this, uh, this uh, quote unquote quantum computer prototype uh, from home. Um, you can see that uh, we've actually made some more progress in, in simplifying the system and make, uh, and these systems are mechanically and optically much more stable than these guys. Uh, we've actually now taken the step uh, to, to even shrink the size down to about a cubic centimeter, a uh, cubic foot, which is about, you know, something that you can hold in your hand. Um, you can almost see now the iron traps may be able to fit into, you know, one of those early HP boxes um, where they, they've done the microwave that way. Um, but what's really more, really very exciting um, progress is last year, there were two papers in Nature where they actually now piped all of the CW lasers, all of these stable lasers that are needed uh, to trap and operate an ion um, onto a chip. In this case, uh, you know, this is an example from the MIT Lincoln Labs work where they bring in all the lasers through an optical fiber, array of optical fibers onto the chip. And underneath the trap, they have all these uh, waveguides uh, that delivers, and then they have these little grating uh, couplers that shoots the beam out of, out of the, uh, the waveguide into free space. And they can actually trap ions in here and do all kinds of manipulation. So once you do that, then, then I think if you can uh, think about combining this with a compact chamber, uh, really the, the entire ion trapping experiment, um, okay, less, uh, of course, left the lasers, which now are on a support instrument rack, Above, a bulk of the effort that is uh, used to reside on an optical table can potentially go onto a chip. And I think this kind of technology progress um, and its prospect is, is really very, very exciting. Um, and the, um, uh, the prospect of quantum computers building, uh, using ion traps, which uh, you know, this is the kind of image that people have uh, in, their, in their minds, uh, really can change uh, into something like this in a span of five years. Okay, now still, this is very early work. There, there's lots of prototyping that we have to do and so on and so forth. Uh, but we do believe that there's room for uh, quantum computers uh, to be practical quantum computers to be built um, out, out of ion traps. Okay, so let me conclude. Uh, we have opportunities for uh, quantum computing. Finally, some quantum computing hardware that you can program and run a customized task is here. Um, and actually the practical engineering work uh, to make these ion trap quantum computers into, into something that's much more reliable and manufacturable um, is, is beginning now. Um, and then um, there's a lot of room for more research in uh, architecture, uh, software tools and programming languages. Now the higher level of uh, stack, um, uh, software stack to, to build, make these quantum computers into much more useful things can begin. Now, as those um, hardware and tools are being developed, now we should really think about what can we do with these systems uh, and finding some practical problems that cannot otherwise be tackled and new computational methods taking advantage of these quantum processors um, and then training new generation of users and programmers in quantum computing. Uh, all of these things can now happen uh, based on the foundation uh, of, on the hardware and software platform. And then hopefully uh, a new quantum uh, a computing industry um, can actually be built on top of these. So with that, I'd like to, to thank um, a lot of my collaborators from various institutions over the years. Um, I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you.
It's just a very, uh, very uh, interesting talk. And uh, we actually got, uh, I think, a lot of questions from the audiences. Uh, they are all in the Q&A box, but given the time constraint, because uh, you are giving actually a public lecture. So let me pick up some questions that's relatively uh, non-technical. <laughs> ah, sure. <laughs> so, because uh, you mentioned like five years, so somebody's asking, do you think we can make more than a thousand qubits or even uh, a million qubits in the next 10 years in IMTREF? Yeah, I mean, that, that, that's a really great question. You know, I, I'd like to see if we can go back to, to this vision, right? So, you know, right now we, um, we, we can put dozens of qubits on, on a single uh, register. Um, and I think with, with, uh, with the shuttling and the QCCD architecture, um, it is probably not a stretch to think about putting, you know, maybe 100 qubits on a, on a single track, right? Um, um, and then I think this is a, a, a pretty uh, interesting uh, notion, but people have made a lot of progress in making the, the connections through photonics. Um, and, uh, you know, maybe uh, one, one thing I, I um, wanted to show you is, uh, you know, some of these optical switches. Um, and these optical switches are real. Um, you know, I, I actually personally built a thousand port optical switch. <laughs> you know, this optical switch had 1100 functional ports. Um, and this was built 20 years ago, right? So these are, are a pretty mature technology. Uh, so if you can think about, uh, you know, having hundreds of qubits in one of these units, and you can actually, actually you know, make them in a reasonable size um, and build a thousand of these things and connect them through one of these optical cross-connect switches that, that's been demonstrated, um, you know, can you build a, a, a quantum computer with 100,000 iron trap, trapped iron qubits? I think the answer is it's feasible. Um, I'm not saying it's easy. It will require a lot of resources, but every um, every technological component and protocols uh, to do that have been done in the lab, right? So I think it's a matter of engineering to pull it all together. So you know, if somebody, uh, if we actually have uh, outstanding talent um, and a lot of resources and a very focused effort to do it, yeah, getting to you know thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of qubits is is totally reasonable in the next ten years. Okay, thanks. So I took another question actually uh, in the chat box. So yeah. how many qubits are implemented in the world's best trap iron computer, uh, quantum computer, I guess. Among them, how many can be used to solve real world problems? Yeah, so, so there, there are, um, you know, a couple of, uh, uh, of different approaches to this. And again, I, I, can, I can, there is commercial activities, but there's also a lot of uh, R&D activities. Um, in my colleague Chris Monroe's lab, you know, they have two different types. In, 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 if you think about the arbitrary, um, you know, quantum computation that you can do on arbitrary qubits, um, I think, I think their, their uh, recent error correction was done on 59 chain, and they can manipulate you know, 13 qubits at will, and that's what they needed to demonstrate this uh, um, uh, Bacon short code. Um, in his uh, sim quantum simulator, where they don't have individual control, but they can have some global control, um, they've they've gone up to about fifty three qubits uh, in an iron trap. Um, so those uh, so I think somewhere between um, one to five dozens is kind of where where the technology is today. Um, now commercially available systems I think a little bit a little bit behind, um, but research labs I think people are pushing the envelope. Now when you say useful, um, that that is actually a pretty interesting question. What what do, what do you mean by useful? And there are many different definitions. If you think about quantum simulation um, of some global properties across 50 qubits, I think people can do that. Um, that's a, probably a little bit more kind of scientific research than arbitrary algorithm uh, execution. I think on an ar arbitrary algorithm execution point of view, um, you not only worry about the number of qubits, but how deep of a circuit you can run. Right? You have to be able to run pretty deep circuits. Because if you have 1,000 qubits but can only run you know, 50 gates, then you can't even entangle them all. Um, so there, I think uh, the, really the, the usefulness uh, really has to be measured in number of qubits, but also uh, the gate fidelities. Um, and there, I think uh, the, the, the real numbers of uh, useful qubits that you can run where the gate depth is reasonably deep is probably in the, in the 5 to 12 range. I think that's kind of where people are today. Okay, thanks. Because uh, you mentioned like 53 qubits, uh, there's a question yeah. on uh, what are the pros and cons compared with the technology or quantum computing based on optical tweezers? Yeah, so that, that's a great, great question. I think the, um, the optical tweezers, um, mostly those are referred to kind of the neutral atoms. Um, and the neutral atoms, I think um, uh, they have made a lot of progress in recent years as well, um, especially they can make uh, large uh, lattices and, and, and 2D traps, they can trap a lot of uh, qubits. 
Um, I think there are a couple of differences though. Um, the neutral atoms are neutral and therefore in order to trap them, you have to use like a dipole trap, like an optical tweezer. Um, and the trapping mechanism also distorts the atom. Um, whereas in the ion traps, um, the atom has charge. So you can use the charge as a, as a handle to, to hold on to these atoms, which I think is, is, uh, is advantageous because they can be much more tightly confined and they, you can hold them to them. You, you can hold on to them with a lot more force. Uh, so that's really one of the advantages. The, um, the uh, neutral atoms, I think this um, Wittberg interaction is used for typical entangling gates. Um, and uh, the, the, the actual error sources for that, I think people have made a, a really uh, dramatic progress in the last two or three years uh, to track that down. Uh, so I think that's a very promising technology. Uh, it, it's, uh, its energy scales are much lower. So I think uh, you, you need a better control of the environment to, to do reliable quantum computing. Um, so, um, but, I, but I think that that's also a very promising technology for sure. Okay, thanks, Johnson. So uh, actually, unfortunately, we're running out of time. <laughs> we actually have another maybe ten questions. <laughs> so we'll okay, see. I'll try to answer the questions on the on the Q and A box you know, for the next fifteen minutes or so. All right. Okay, thank you so much.